In 1788, in the meeting to ratify the Constitution of the United States in North Carolina, the convention to ratify the Constitution, the, there was a huge debate whether there should be a religious litmus test in Article II of the Constitution that only a Protestant could be president. William Lancaster, a delegate from, to the North Carolina Convention says, but let us remember, we are forming a government for millions not yet in existence. I do not have the art of divination in the course of four or 500 years. I do not know how it will work. He's worried about this country they're establishing. He doesn't know what it's going to look like in the future. This is most certain, he says, that a papist might occupy that chair, that a Mohammedan might take it. The chair he's talking about is the presidency of the United States, and Mohammedan is what they used to call Muslims. Could a Muslim be president? In the debate to ratify the Constitution of the United States, Lancaster, an anti federalist is predicting the scenario that it might come up one day that a Muslim wants to run for office. Should there be a religious litmus system in the Constitution that only a, a Protestant could be president? At the end of this entire discussion, what we see that in American constitutional history, Muslims become symbolically embroiled in the definition of what is going to be this thing called America. And so the ratification of the Constitution in this debate, the result is that there would be no religious litmus test. And it forces the Federalists and Anti-Federalists to agree that one day a Muslim could be president. This was in the ratification of our Constitution. That's why our Constitution is so beautiful. That's why it's great. That's what makes this country great. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. That's what makes this country so, when we're talking about 2008 run up to the election, this fear rhetoric works because people have been already believing in the mistrust narrative, that there's something to be afraid of, there's something out there about these Muslims. The ideas that this country was founded on are the values that most Americans hold dear. When Thomas Jefferson, a philosopher, envisions a country that's really just a neutral space, that everyone's going to be welcome, he's predicting that neutrality. And that's why, for the most part, you see people coming together to stand against this together, because these are values that most Americans hold dear. But according to Gallup, 86% of Americans see Muslims in a negative light. This is one worse than one week after 9-11, that 86% of Muslims see 86% of Americans see Muslims in a negative way. It's worse today than it was one week after 9-11. Islamophobia is at such a high today than it was one week after 9-11 that there is this return of an exclusionary identity, that Muslims don't belong, that we use the fear rhetoric against refugees when this is a country of refugees. The fear rhetoric of refugees is so misinformed because the refugee population is the most vetted population. They actually have to go through three levels of vetting that takes up to 18 months. Technically, refugees are the safest people because they've been going through an 18 month background check at three different levels. The idea that they're the ones who are going to not just take your jobs, but bring insecurity to the nation is part of the rhetoric of Islamophobia. It aims to target other communities. How does this affect our Muslim identity? And this is about the internalization. When our identity is constantly defined for us, when Muslims are told you are not us, then you begin to construct your identity as a reaction. And when your identity is constructed as a reaction, and a reaction to an illogical frame, an irrational frame, then you're actually doing this service to what we are because you're not saying what Muslims are, but you're saying what Muslims are not. And this can't be the case because we have today, more than ever, to be steadfast. Because Muslims might be the target today, but there will be another group tomorrow. And so if we don't stand up against the anti-Muslim rhetoric that actually aims to target other minority communities, we think about this. Post 9-11, the, the, the idea that 
um, there was going to be legislation passed to bring security to the nation, so there would be mass deportation of Muslims. Technically, between 9-11 uh, between and today, only 11,000, I know I'm saying only, but technically only 11,000 people were deported back to Muslim-majority countries, while hundreds of thousands have been deported back to Mexico. It is easy to use the fear rhetoric of Muslims to actually target immigrants, to target illegal immigration. So you use the fear rhetoric against Muslims to get policy passed that you actually want to get passed. And so that's what we need to be aware of, that it's not just about us, that it's actually about justice. And when we as a community understand that justice is not about just us, then the title of your talk that is about subjugation of all minorities starts to really mean something so much more. Because it's not just about Muslims, it's simply about just justice. And that's what we need to capture, to hold on to that idea. And that's why we have to be steadfast, because we have no other option. You can't be afraid, you can't be afraid to pray, you can't be afraid to say I'm Muslim, you can't be afraid of all of these things, because if you are, then the Islamophobes have won. And once that we've been defeated in that regard, thinking that there's something wrong with Islam and Muslims, then they just move on to the next group. And our job is not simply to stop racism and bigotry against the Muslim, the Muslim community. Our job is to stop racism and bigotry, period. And if we think that we have it bad, I'll tell you, in one of my graduate classes, um, right after the election, you know, people were walking around with PTSD. I'm calling it post-election PTSD, right? Very upset, not sure what to do, almost traumatized, right? And because of the nature of the subject I teach, most of my students are you know, primarily white males. Um, and I have one African-American graduate student who is sitting in the back listening to everyone's PTSD, and he's just scratching his head. He's like, are you guys kidding me? Welcome to my America. I have been stopped and frisked three times. I have seen the bottom of the barrel of a gun, right? You guys are upset about what? That you're next? If you really care about justice, none of this was acceptable for me when it was happening to me, but where were you guys? Justice is not just about us. Justice is talking about how do we actually eradicate structural injustices. Structural injustices don't just affect Muslims and minorities. If we really want to understand the outcome of the election, really understand, and we're talking about the Rust Belt, Right? The rust belt determined this, that there were economic constraints that were hurting parts of America that everyone had ignored. The number one group, the number one suicide rate, the group that is hurt most by suicide, is uneducated white males. High suicide rate is, against, is, is in, amongst one, uneducated white males. We have to ask ourselves, believe it or not, we're a privileged community, right? We're a privileged community in that regard. We have to ask ourselves, what do we do to reach out to those who are economically hurting? To actually talk about what Islam stands for is to actually stand up against all structural injustices and how they not just hurt Muslims, but, and not just how they hurt minorities, but how they hurt America. There are structural economic injustices that hurt everyone. And if we're really going to think about how do we redefine what it means to be Muslim in America, not against the Islamophobic narrative, but redefine what it means to be a Muslim American, then that justice understanding cannot be about just us. I see everyone standing in my overtime. No, no, oh, okay. <laughs> um, <coughs> According to Gallup, Muslim Americans, especially the women, Muslim women are of the most highly educated minority groups in America. They, Muslim Americans are of the most economically stable minority groups. What does that mean? Because of the fact that Muslim groups, Muslims can't engage in economically unjust practices, when the 2008 economic crisis hit, it didn't hit the Muslim community the way it hit other communities. Why is that a positive thing, not just for Muslims, but for America, especially for the state of New Jersey, especially for Middlesex County, 
that has a very large Muslim uh, minority population is because it didn't hit the New Jersey economy in this area as much as it hit other places. In that regard, Muslim Americans, Muslims in New Jersey, not their economic stability helps the state of New Jersey. According to a study out of the University of Seattle that one of my colleagues and friends, Karam Dana, has done, what he finds is that the more mosque-going you are, the more civic-minded you are. Meaning that the more mosque-going you are, the more American you become in, in that you actually care about the entire nation. You go to the mosque, you hear what's happening, you actually do something about it. The more mosque-going you are, the more civic-minded you become. According to a study done by a colleague at Princeton University, what she finds is that the more, not just you read Quran, the deeper your understanding of the Quran is, the more pro-justice you become for everyone. The deeper your understanding of justice becomes. And so, knowing all of that, what becomes our job, not just to understand the nature of our faith, but the nature of our faith in this country. When we talk about minority groups, so we see communities that are fundamentally hit in different ways. So let's talk about what happened a year and a half ago in Baltimore. In Baltimore, Maryland, there was a young man named Freddie Gray. Right? We all heard about this, and you've heard the songs that have come out about it. Freddie Gray was a young black man who got a rough ride in the back of a police van and died, right? which led to major protests in the street. Remember this? It was the summer before last. What do we know about Freddie Gray? Freddie Gray grew up in one of the worst parts of Baltimore. He grew up in a home laced with lead. He grew up in one of the worst education systems. He grew up in a place where only 5% of kids will go from kindergarten to graduate from college. And if we in America believe that college is the gateway to the middle class, only 5% will get into college, I'm sorry, graduate from college. He grew up in a, in a country where one in three black men will go to college, will go to, will go to prison. One in three black men will go to prison. Freddie Gray, before he did anything, grew up in a system of structural injustice. Everything about Freddie Gray's existence that we know on paper is fundamentally against the ethos, the ethos of our faith. Because our faith is about justice, because the first commandment of our faith is justice. In the Quran, that Allah commands us in the Quran with Adam, justice, and then Ihsan. What is Ihsan? Ihsan is the highest level of Iman. And in this ayah, Allah says, justice comes first. That means that everything about Freddie Gray's existence should not have been the way it is. And so if justice is going to be about real justice and not just us, then we get down in the inner city and start talking about what justice actually has to look like. But all is not bleak. And so I'll end on a positive note. I believe that youth, you, your generation, is the great equalizers. You're writing your stories. You are emailing and you're texting and you're WhatsApping and you're posting and you're tweeting and you're retweeting and you're checking in and you're G-chatting and you're blogging and you're YouTube, YouTubing and you're vlogging and you're hijab tutorialing and other tutorialings and you're uploading and you're downloading and you're updating Facebook and Instagram and Snapchat and you're speaking a language that actually knows no bounds. This is the great, great equalizing mechanism. That the Islamophobia industry might be a $50 million a year industry, but the youth are a completely different ballgame. Remember the story of the boy with the clock? Young boy in Texas shows up to school with the clock. And how did we all know the story of Ahmed? Remember the hashtag campaign, I stand with Ahmed? A young high school or college girl, I don't remember her age, starts the hashtag campaign, I stand with Ahmed. And within two days, President Obama is tweeting, I stand with Ahmed. And this boy gets invited not just to the White House, but to MIT and Google and Yahoo and, and all the big uh, technology companies and all the big universities. So young girl starting a hashtag campaign, I stand with Ahmed. When the three young people were killed in um, execution style in North Carolina, 
that was a local story. How did it become an international story? Again, a young person started the hashtag campaign Our Three Winners, and that went viral. The potential in this group, in the youth, in this generation, is that this generation not just gives voice to the voiceless, this generation will be the counterbalance to the $50 million a year Islamophobia industry. Because it's not just imbibed in our Islamic ideals, it's actually imbibed also in our civic mindedness as Americans. Today, this is a generation that understands in many ways, and we've seen in the past 18 months, that our lives will never matter until black lives matter. That until we understand the ills and injustices of the inner city and work towards a just society, that breaking the boundaries of privilege that say we can't fight for Muslim rights without fighting for equal rights and equal education and equal access to affordable housing and ending mass incarceration of black men in this country at a for-profit prison industrial complex, drone strikes that hit people that look like us in other places, the sale of cluster bombs and tear gas that aim to crush the democratic aspirations of places of people in other places. If we are truly to break the boundaries of what it means to be a Muslim American today, then that is our story. That is fundamentally tied to the stories of others. That we can't break the Islamophobic narrative without understanding it's about structural injustices. And that if the acceptable narrative today is anti-Muslim bigotry, it becomes extremely important for us to stand up against anti-Muslim bigotry because the consequences don't just have effects for us, they actually have effects for justice. It is your generation, it is you millennials, that everyone is saying is selfish and self-absorbed and taking selfies that really has the potential to redefine what it means to not just be an American, but to redefine how we understand the place of Muslims in America. To really say our faith and our make as Americans, we are both civically required and religiously obligated to be civically minded. You're writing your story, and you're not, in that regard, not letting your story be written for you. So I'll end with a story. Um, when, when I was younger, my father would, would you know, I was very studious, right? He'd be studying up in my bedroom in the middle of the night. I remember one night my father coming up to my bedroom. He's like, Dad, what are you doing? I'm like, Bo, I'm studying. Like, Why are you studying so hard? I'm like, Bo, because when I graduate from college, I'm not just going to graduate. I'm going to graduate with the highest honors. Like, I want them to say my name, highest honors. My father said to me, this is a long time ago because I'm much older than you think. He says to me words I'll never forget. He says, Dalia, Allah Taala does not care if you graduate from college with honors, if it's For example, are there instances where Latinos and Muslims work together to combat an issue? So if you're asking me strategically speaking, I don't know because I'm not in strategy planning. Um, is there potential? Have there been examples? Yes, there have been. Um, but what we, I think what we need to realize is that um, for example, in the run-up um, to this you know, last election where the initial targets were Mexicans being considered 
you know, all the names on your flyer, right? Rapists, scary drug dealers, out to get um, your women and your children, the sources of insecurity. Uh, Muslims are characterized in very similar ways. So are African Americans. Um, it's not just about alliance formation among minority groups. It's, it need, I believe it needs to go beyond that. There has to be a redefinition of not just how we see the self and the other, but how we see our place in the United States. I don't think we should insist on a, on a, on a minority status, but on a majority status that insists that we are all in this together and that we will reclaim American values in that regard and that there can't be the whitewashing um, or making America great by making America perceivably white. That is the narrative that we're trying to, that we should be countering. And that not just happens in conjunction, but that happens in not accepting that this is an issue of minority versus majority. Because in essence, it's an issue of America, and if you look at the numbers, the majority isn't white. Um, okay, so the next question. Uh, what can we do as young college students to actively dispel the bias the media spews? What are realistic options for those of us, especially ones not in the field of media and journalism? So this is my favorite story because I actually teach here, right? So um, I won't say his name, but there's a professor here that's the pre-law advisor. So my office and his office um, were a few doors down from one another. And um, every now and then, a student would come to him with like a C average, bomb the LSAT, and you know, wants to go to Stanford Law. And so this professor would yell in the direction of my office, can you believe this idiot, Dahlia, this idiot is in my, he just left my office, he wants to go to Stanford Law, he doesn't have the grades, hasn't done anything, he's coming to see me like the last day of his senior year. Um, and so this would happen quite often, that this professor would yell in the direction of my office about you know, a C or D student that is coming to him that wants to go to top law school. So one time, this is the background, one time we're sitting in a meeting and there's many people there. And so the same professor says to me, Dahlia, there's a student in your class. So I know what's coming next, right? There's a student in your class, he was just in my office, um, he's in your class and he's in my class too and his name is Muhammad. And I was like, oh. because I know it's going to come, right? And so he says, this guy comes to class prepared. He elevates the class conversation. He's extremely inquisitive. This is a guy that we need to keep our eye on because he is going to go to law school. Muhammad went to Stanford Law. We all think that we need to be media savvy and tweeting and hashtagging. You dispel myths by being a good Muslim. And you be a good Muslim by being extremely studious and conscientious and honest student. It's not about Islam awareness week. Believe it or not, this is not a knock to Islam awareness week. It's not about pitching a tent. It's not about blasting Quran at them and making noise pollution out of it, right? Where people counter it with music. You know, I, I was on Rutgers campus, I know. It's not about that. It's actually about living Islam, right? It's about being the examples that not just we are required to be, it's about being the examples that we need to be. Because if we're gonna prevent any more Freddie Grays, we don't have time to waste. Right? So it's really about for every professor to say, oh my gosh, there's a Ali in my class. Oh my gosh, there's a Hassan. Oh my gosh, there's a Muhammad. And look at them. They're going to go to Stanford Law. Thank you. Um, next question. Um, okay. How should those who aren't minorities act in these types of situations how should they address their white privilege in terms of portrayal in the media? I'm not 
of sure of where to go with that one because it's so easy to it's so easy for us to talk about white privilege and it's reduce it to white people, right? Right? White privilege is not about white people. White privilege is about structural institutions that you don't see injustice, right? But for the most part, um, there are many allies in this because it's about what it means to be America. It's about the liberal values that we hold dear. So we can't reduce white privilege to white people. White privilege is not actually seeing the injustice, right? For example, in that class, when everyone's walking with PTSD post-election, and my African-American student says, did you not see it, right? That's white privilege. And so in many regards, especially on college campuses, I mean, this generation is the one that overwhelmingly voted blue, right? This was this is the kind of Bernie Sanders generation. This is the one that look, that's looking at economic um, structural injustices. And there's real reasons for this. If you think about young people today, your age, especially those that have college loans, college loans today are at the credit card rate, right? When I was in college, college loans were nothing like this. Not just that, there were many more grants that students would, would get. So students in college today are much more heavily indebted than ever before. You, if, if you, if, I mean, I know we're at a public university, but if you're at a private university and you have three to four hundred thousand dollars in loans, when you graduate college to pay off, for example, NYU tuition, you cannot pay it off until you're in your mid thirties. Which means home ownership happens when? Which means saving for your children's college education happens when? So when we think about who's affected by all of this, it's actually everyone. And so thinking about how do you form um, allies, it's on the principle of injustice that hurt everyone. Um, and these questions are coming into the numbers. So the next one says, first of all, amazing speech. Secondly, is not social media a double-edged sword? I feel as though while social media has revamped activism, but it's also a huge source of distraction and narcissism. Thoughts? This is like the auntie and he's gonna come out. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Um, however, there's a lot of caveats here. Um, social media as a distraction from studying, don't do that. Um, social media as a way, as a platform to engage in a conversation, absolutely. Is social media enough? We know it's not, right? You know, soapbox, soapbox activism that is not followed through, we all know what that leads to. You know, um, because I teach on the Middle East, we talk, for example, about how the Arab Spring, people teach it as a technological revolution. If it was not built on real movements, and real, for example, labor movements, and social justice movements, if it, there wasn't the groundwork before and after, the media would not have done anything. And so social media, for many people, it's not about posting and tweeting and retweeting and that's it. It's about actually caring. It's about showing up. Because if we want people to show up for us, we have to show up, period. So let me say it like this. What do we know about our prophet? What was he called? I just said uh, Asad al Amin, right? The truthful, the honest, the trustworthy, right? Those are what we, the kind of um, characteristics we know about him. It doesn't mean simply honest. It doesn't mean truth telling. Because in that time period, because of the honor of the tribal system, everyone was honest. What it meant was that the Prophet stood up and spoke truth to power. Was that the Prophet spoke truth to everyone when there was an injustice happening in another tribe, this is before he's a prophet, when there was an injustice happening to someone in another tribe, he spoke the truth to power. That's why he was known as the truthful one. That's why he was known as a trustworthy. It's not about not fibbing, all right, or not lying. It's about actually standing up and saying the truth. And so if we really want to talk about what does it mean to be part of the social media discourse, it's not just tweeting it, but it's showing up. When there's a vigil here on campus, it's about being there. It's about when someone says, oh, in New Brunswick, the food pantry runs out every single week. Gosh, thank God the Muslims show up, right? 
It's when we start hearing people say, oh my gosh, don't worry about it, the Muslims got it. The Muslims are here. When Hurricane Sandy happened, just a couple of years ago, right? Usually when I give examples, my students raise their hands and say we weren't born yet. Um, but Hurricane single doctor and engineer can apply. If you're an un and several Rutgers students have applied and have been accepted. If you are uh, majoring in any of the humanities, any of the social sciences, in the arts, there is a film um, grant that several of our students have actually gone on and won Emmy Awards. Um, many people that you know in social media have been, are ISF scholars. So uh, the ISF competition is going to start in two weeks. I suggest you go to the website, um, apply, and there are about 12 categories, and we've given out millions and millions of dollars. That comes from the Muslim community. That comes from individuals that believe that Muslims in media and social sciences and in the humanities and in the arts um, need to be supported. So there is support out there. It needs to grow. Um, so that is all the time we have for Q&A. So another big round of applause for honors. <laughs> Thank you. 